Hello and welcome to Instant Transmission, a podcast where we discuss everything Dragon Ball and another shout out and thanks to Captain Alex 60 Nice for supporting us. Boo's reckless and uncontrollable evil has been revealed and with the Earth and most of its defenders now turned into space dust, it's now time for our two most likely heroes to save the day, Goku and Mr. Vegeta. I hope you're not too attached to your planet because tonight we're going to rock your world on this episode of Instant Transmission. I'm your host, Dayton, and once again, I'm joined by my co-host, Todd. Hi. And tonight we'll be covering Kai's final chapters or Dragon Ball Kai's final episodes, 159 through 167, uh, finishing off Dragon Ball Kai's all together. This is it. This is the last episode of us covering episodes of Kai, so... Get ready as we move our way into the Evil Boo Saga to finish things off. After a ferocious battle with Super Boo, his form is once again twisted and changed after having his absorbed victims removed from his body. Devolving into his original form of Kid Boo, his chaotic and evil nature is put on full display after annihilating the entire planet. Goku and Vegeta are transported to the world of the Kais where they draw Kid Boo to them so they can battle the monster and end his universal rampage once and for all. Goku taking the lead on this one. And with all of that covered, was there anything you wanted to add before we got things started, Todd? No, I'm ready to dive in and get everything wrapped up for Kai. Heck yeah. All right. Well, this episode begins with Goku eyeing up Kid Buu as they prepare to face off once more. With a roar, Goku powers up into Super Saiyan 3 and the battle begins. Vegeta, Hercule, and all the Kais and divine beings watching from the sidelines as the two Titans of unbelievable power begin the battle that will decide the fate of the universe. This is awesome. Sean Schemmel here as the voice of Goku fucking kills it on the transformation powering up to Super Saiyan 3. And then we dive into... I think the fighting between Goku and Boo is some of the best fighting that we see, maybe in all of Dragon Ball period. Uh, this one, honestly, is no exception uh, as... Goku kind of, like, throws in some heavy blows, grabs onto Boo's antenna, like, punches him multiple times, and then Boo uses the antenna that Goku is grabbing onto to wrap it around Goku's neck and then, like, lean in and headbutt him. And Goku eventually gets off a blast, kind of, like, turning Boo into pieces. And then as Boo begins to reform... He literally has to pull his head out of his ass as his legs kind of form up as the upper half, his head kind of between his legs and his lower half pointed or his upper torso pointed downward. Uh, it is a really great way to start off this episode. And I mean, it's it's this is, I think, probably my favorite element of Boo is how fun of an opponent he is, how they really take a lot of liberties to take kind of the weird physics of his body or his magic physics and really just go crazy with them. We see there are times where he gets punched and his body stretches way back from the blow and then swings all the way back and, you know, strikes Goku in the head. And there's all this crazy stuff that's happening. Um, he even uses himself. And we've seen this before where he turns into like a big sail and catches himself as he's flying through the air. Like, He's doing all this stuff that you would not be able to see with really any other opponent. And I'm glad they took these liberties. They're crazy. They're out there and they're fun. Absolutely. And you've you've mentioned specifically, Dayton, that you really like the kind of like Boo's anatomy and how interesting it can make a fight. I feel like Kid Boo or Evil Boo, whatever you want to call him here, I think his anatomy, his unique anatomy and his like taffy-like body is on its best display here with Kid Buu. I think they use it to its uh, to its absolute peak in this fight against Goku. And we kind of continue through watching as... I mean, the Earth is destroyed, but there are still other people who are watching this fight. We've got people on in other world, some of our good people like uh, Krillin, Yamcha, they're kind of there with King Kai watching. We've got this giant crystal ball in hell or Hiffel where a lot of our bad guys are watching this fight. We get to see Frieza and Cell and the Ginyu Force and eventually even Bobbity commenting on the fight, which I really enjoyed. I <laughs> I think, um, what is it? 
Bobbity's a little, little torn on who he wants to win the fight, right? Because if Boo wins, then like that's his like creation, and he can kind of maybe ride those coattails a little bit. But if Goku wins, then he kind of gets revenge on Boo for killing him. So it's, you know, it's kind of a, a hard pill for him to swallow watching this battle happen. He's a little bit bitter, for sure. You get that impression because Boo killed his creator. And it's it's like a fun little detail. He even says like, oh, I taught Boo all he knows, which is, you know, like a clear lie. But I mean, if you're in hell, you want to get every social advantage that you can manage here. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as we flip back to the fight between Boo and Goku, Goku realizes that he's starting to lose this battle. And we see him at one point put his arms back and he charges and fires off a Kamehameha wave that seems to sap the, the last of his energy. And I mean, he put everything into this and I know it's not going to work because this Kamehameha wave is not animated super well. So <laughs> I immediately know it's not going to kill him. Um, but our bubblegum villain, he regenerates all of his little, well, he was blasted to bits and then all of his little bits regenerate into even smaller kid boos, once again, kind of going with that childish nature of the, uh, um, I guess, that he has, his childish, reckless nature. And we see all these tiny little bits all unleash their own key barrage. And Goku's just blasted back and falls to the ground. And we see his long, golden Super Saiyan 3 hair reverting back to black as he's officially tapped out at this point. Yeah, he's gassed, man. He's... He's basically been fighting Boo at his max capacity in his strongest form, and, and Boo Vegeta doesn't get tired, to... right? Like I, yeah, they've been fighting for a long time. Boo's been fighting this and like for so many people for forever, and just never seems to run out of gas. Yeah, that seems to be something inherently maybe about the magic that makes up Boo's uh, body, but this results in Vegeta kind of going over and being like. I'm going to tap in. This is my time. You rest. Uh, I'll give you, you know, I'll, at the very least, I don't think that I'm going to be able to beat him, but I'm going to give you a moment to actually rest and recuperate, Kakarot. Now, Dayton, remind me if this is correct. I don't think that Vegeta has even really participated in the fight against Kid Buu up to this point. Is that right? My understanding up till this point is no, he, if I remember correctly, didn't they play rock, paper, scissors to see who would have the first crack at fighting Kid Buu? And so Vegeta has been on the sidelines this entire time. The closest thing he had to any interaction was almost being blown up with the earth itself. Yeah. So yeah, I, that's how I remember it as well. And so this there's just this one detail here that is really weird to me because Vegeta hasn't really fought. So we know, I mean, he can't be gassed, right? But he goes into this fight in his base form. He doesn't transform into Super Saiyan. He doesn't transform into Super Saiyan 2. He, he knows even in Super Saiyan 2 that he's going to be outclassed by Boo. So it's very strange to me that he chooses to go in his base form. Do you have any thoughts about that, Dayton? So, okay. So I have a couple thoughts here. One is um, Vegeta is, is still dead at this point, right? Like he's got the halo. Right. Um, that could be playing an effect where like Goku with his time being um, brought into the realm of the living was coming to an end. Um, he wasn't like recovering energy. He wasn't getting like better. He was actually like getting more tired the longer he was away from other world. So I'm wondering if maybe that plays an effect here. Um, and he did before Goku and him fused into Vegito. He did try to fight Boo on his own and kind of got his his crap kicked in at that point. So there, I mean, I don't think there's much of a reason. I'm just trying to go off of maybe some breadcrumbs that were laid earlier to draw these dots together. But if that's the case, they have not told me that I'm making that up. Right. Yeah. And those are, I mean, both of those, well, I, I think the first one could be more of a stretch from my mind, but that's mostly because well, like you said, with Goku, um, Baba basically said, hey, you only have 24 hours. And she was the one who brought Vegeta back. We're not really sure if that was like 
Baba's power, or if that was, it kind of almost sounded more like it was King Yemma's power. Yeah, but that's we, what it sounded like to me too, which if anything should be even better. Right. And we weren't given a time limit with that either. And I mean, maybe there is, maybe you're right. Maybe it, it, it does have a time limit. And because of that, Vegeta is going to get, he's going to lose his energy or his ability to remain in the realm of the living. Um, but yes, like you said, in, in any of these cases, we as the audience kind of have to make these inferences and kind of come up with some reason. It just seems strange to me. Like, Goku has been through most of the same things. And yeah, we're kind of expressing, yeah, Goku's stronger than Vegeta now. But Goku's going up into Super Saiyan 3 and Vegeta's not going into Super Saiyan at all. <laughs> yeah, I... I... <laughs> For some reason, I don't remember this. Vegeta stepping in in base form in fighting like this because my thought was like, all right, like... It's going to be a tough fight because Super Saiyan 3 was barely enough to keep it your footing. Super Saiyan 2 is going to be an uphill battle. Base form shouldn't even be a fight. Like, why would you even attempt to go in like that if you could even go Super Saiyan 1? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I mean, maybe it's a minor complaint. I don't know. It, it, it just seemed weird. But Vegeta, I mean, we quickly find out he's wildly outclassed in his base form. He's able to kind of blast Boo's body and, you know, just destroy it by the nature of Boo's body. But Boo quickly just demolishes Vegeta with like a quick kick and a headbutt uh, and is very quickly about to blast Vegeta into oblivion. And Goku comes in having to intervene with a quick and swift headbutt. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it, it's been like two minutes, right? It really hasn't been hardly any amount of time at all that Vegeta was able to to give Goku a breather. And Goku shows back up and he says, hey, I'm going to step back in. Um, You can take the back seat now. And then I, I want to get your feelings on this because we get a moment where Vegeta, like, kind of internally begins to appreciate um, I guess Goku's journey to where he is now. Um, I don't know if I described that correctly, but that's what it seemed like to me. Yeah, I think that that's, that's about right. I mean, we even get, it, it's not elaborately animated, but redrawn scenes from Goku's journey from the Saiyan saga, a lot of it is kind of like, I'd almost call it like a slideshow. They're like barely animated little clips, but it's cool to see them kind of redrawn in modern style regardless. And I, I mean, for me as a Vegeta fanboy and somebody who loves Vegeta's story arc through the Boo saga, I love this uh, honestly really? okay all right i wasn't sure how <laughs> how you're gonna react to that so that's why that's why i threw it up to you yeah um to kind of dive into this a little bit more i think the important part is is towards the tail end of this like little flashback as vegeta's thinking on like all of goku's or kakarot's accomplishments and every time that kakarot had surpassed Vegeta or just uh, honestly just like got better than him and then just stayed like leagues above him and Vegeta is basically saying like I thought maybe the difference was that you had friends and family that you cared about and that you were fighting for and then I found myself with a family of my own and it didn't make up that difference and I think his final note and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here but is something to the effect of Vegeta saying that he has always fought to beat others down, to keep them down beneath him, whereas Goku has only fought for himself and to challenge himself and see how far he can go. And this is... I, I mean, if you look at the entirety of Dragon Ball Z... This is the story between Goku and Vegeta. And the cool thing is that Goku has always has always pushed himself and he's always tried very hard and he's always succeeded as a result. It's nice to see somebody like that succeed. And it's nice to see Vegeta come to that realization that the fact that the the only thing that he's been fighting for is to beat other people down beneath him is not the right way to 
grow as a person, whether that be as a fighter or really just in anything. So this is Vegeta finally realizing that and saying, Kakarot, you are better than me. You are the only one who can defeat Majin Buu. Yeah, I think um, I think you summed that up probably way better than I could have. And I I agree with that interpretation. I do think it's it's a growth moment for Vegeta where because we've had a couple moments like this up to this point, right? Where Vegeta has been kind of self-reflecting on himself a lot throughout um, the entire Buu series. And it starts off with the the World Martial Arts Tournament and then his sacrifice. And now and we're kind of seeing this internal journey with Vegeta because he's kind of plateaued. He's kind of been unable to work himself out of this rut that he's been in. And we see that that internal struggle kind of playing out. And this is we're getting kind of kind of to the conclusion of that internal struggle where he actually shows that character development. Um, I I do like Vegeta's kind of internal growth throughout um uh, I guess the Boo series quite a bit because it's it's internal growth. It's not something where he's learning a new technique or learned a new form or something like that. It's it's much more nuanced. And when you kind of cover it, especially I don't think I noticed it as much until we did instant transmission. But it's it actually if you listen to those monologues kind of next to each other, you see that growth and you see that whole story arc kind of come together. So it's a lot better than I think I may have given it credit for before. And I like this punctuation right here. I'm glad to hear your take on that. And I, I'm glad that you having watched it. I mean, I, like I said, I love this. So it's nice to hear that you kind of have a, a more of a, an appreciation for it as well. And kind of his story, because Again, a lot of people don't like the Boo arc, and I, I understand. You and I have talked at length about the problems with the Boo arc. But man, does it have some great moments and some great story arcs. And Vegeta's is maybe, well, we'll, we'll see the one that I think is maybe the best coming up. But Vegeta's might, is probably second best in my mind. Uh, and that is the, like... Even though we stepped away from Goten and Trunks and Gohan taking over, the one thing that I I have no idea how they would have fit this in here otherwise, the one thing that I would have been very sad to miss out on if Gohan or Goten and Trunks kind of like took the lead is this last moment of Vegeta's story arc kind of coming to a close. And like you said, getting that perfect punctuation at the end of his story i don't know how we would have gotten that if gohan and goten and trunks kind of took over i don't know where that would have come in i mean it's now that we've seen it and we have it and we appreciate it it's it's hard to imagine a world where we don't have it and i mean i'm happy with it i'm really happy with the way that vegeta's written in this um and i mean it's yeah i i like this conclusion that we're getting into with vegeta but i'm gonna keep pushing this train forward as oh, yeah. kid boo and Goku continue their battle. Um, this is the scene, I think I kind of mentioned this earlier, where Goku punches Boo so hard that his upper body stretches off into the distance, and he actually makes a face at Mr. Satan kind of spooking him because he's a giant child, or Kid Boo's a giant child. And then we see him kind of snap back, headbutting Goku in the face, sending him flying. Um, we get some more of those uh, kicks where he jams his foot into the ground and they come popping back up. And that's something I wanted to comment on, too, is a lot of these crazy and goofy moves that um, Boo's using right now, we've seen them kind of one off in a lot of other places. And we're seeing all of that kind of come together in a full fighting style. I think it's actually very well written the way they they kind of put Boo together into this final battle. I agree. Yeah, that's a that's a really great detail to kind of point out here. There's I mean, it's so it's so fun and engaging this whole fight with Goku and Boo, because they their fighting styles feel very very distinct and very characterized for each of them uh you've kind of pointed that out for boo i'm gonna point out i love goku fucking grabbing boo by the head and like biting his head and also <laughs> just goku like this is uh, the whole universe is at stake right this is a devastating battle and there are so many moments where despite the fact that Goku is, you know, trying his hardest and struggling, 
many times where Boo comes at him, Goku is making like this exaggerated, comical, goofy face. And that feels very Goku. Like, I, I feel like it's it's placed in here sparsely enough where it doesn't take away the tension, but it still feels like it's really showing us who these characters are. And I think that's a tough um, tightrope to try and navigate is you want to like Goku's always going to have that kind of, I don't know, immature, childish side to him. He grew up in the woods and basically raised himself. Um, so and you're never really going to get rid of that. But at the same time, you also need to make Goku a functional adult. And they don't always do a great job of figuring out which side of that tightrope they're leaning on. And so... I like it when it's written well, like right here, Goku is serious. He is trying to win, but I mean, he's also a kid who grew up in the woods and as a child would bite people if he needed to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I agree with everything you had to say on that. I think we get to the tail end of this. I wanted to just point out this uh, scene in the, at the end of this episode where Majin Buu or Kid Buu throws out a Kamehameha and uh, I mean, we, we've we seen Kid Buu already figure out how to use, like, some form of instant transmission just by seeing it once. So he's kind of that, got that, like, Goku savant, savant sort of. Yeah. Yeah. But that's followed up immediately by Goku shooting off his own Kamehameha at Kid Buu that Kid Buu tries to, like, double hammer fist knock away. And it just blows through his arms like tearing off half of his body and goku has this to me is like this great zinger where he's like are you taking notes that's what a real kamehameha should look like i'm like oh <laughs> you're so badass uh see i i was laughing at the fact that kid boo just like goes through the entire motion and then just like kind of stops like nothing had happened like yep i did it i knocked it <laughs> i don't know it's a great scene and it shows both of the characters personalities it's it's fun I, there's a lot of fun moments in this fight absolutely i think that pretty much moves us on to the next episode though it does which is episode 160 a minute matchup vegeta's life-threatening stall for time and the battle continues and the two exchange some Key blasts, Goku using the explosion to kind of slip away and surprise Boo from behind, just hammering him into the ground. And then after just kind of bashing him into the dirt, we see him place his hand on Boo's head and then just key blast the entire earth beneath them. And it's kind of a cool looking scene where he just kind of uh, the whole ground beneath him kind of gives way as he blows everything up. I mean, just so many good set pieces in this fight. I would say maybe even better ones than the Vegito fight and and way better animated as far as the choreography. But just what a cool moment to like knock somebody in the ground and then like just place a hand on them and blast them into oblivion with a key blast. Not that it finishes Boo off, but it, man, it looks cool. <laughs> yeah, and I mean... Of course, Boo comes out of this pretty much unscathed, and the two continue their battle, but they're underground now. And I thought they were going to be here longer, but they're really not. Uh, uh, Goku's pretty much immediately like blasted back up above ground, and uh, they're not there anymore, which kind of made me sad because I thought there, I couldn't remember any underground fighting, and then afterwards I was like, oh, that's why. It's yeah, it's almost non-existent. I um, I like cool backdrops. I like cool settings to fight in. So anytime you can kind of change that up or give me a curveball, I'm into it. Yeah, I totally agree. But in this case, they kind of come back up, and as Boo is reforming from Goku's last blast, Goku and Vegeta are having a little conversation where Vegeta is like, "Hey." don't hold back on my account. Like, don't worry about my pride and my ego. I know that you, if you give it your all in Super Saiyan 3, you should have the power to blow him away. So do it. And Goku's like, I've been trying, man, but Boo just keeps coming at me. I, I haven't had, I need some time so that I can actually charge up like enough energy to finish him off for good. And Vegeta's like, Oh, I like this realization from Vegeta where he's like, oh, you haven't been messing around. You're actually in trouble. <laughs> yeah. And Goku's like, I just need a minute. Like, I just need a minute to get myself together, to get my energy put together. And then I should be able to take them. And 
Vegeta offers to step in and buy him that one minute, right? That's all he needs is one minute. I like nice hard numbers like that because you definitely don't regret giving people hard numbers. Um, <laughs> so Vegeta steps in and I mean, he, not only is he far outclassed in this fight, Goku reminds us as the audience mostly that if he dies, he disappears from existence for good. So the stakes are extremely high for Vegeta in this case. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I mean, Vegeta's dead death in Dragon Ball oftentimes is trivial, but if you die twice, like die upon on top of being dead, there's no coming back from that. There's no Dragon Balls or no Shenron or Puranga who's going to pull you back from oblivion at that point. Uh, but Vegeta being the absolute badass that he is, he's like, let me do this. I, I think he even has something, some sort of line where he's like, I'm going to put the last bit of my pride on the line here and I'm going to make this happen. I will get you that minute, even if I'm way outmatched. And I mean, Vegeta's, he's not a sideline guy. He's not someone to sit by and watch someone come in and save the day and, you know, be the hero. He's, he's not going to stand there and watch all the glory be sucked away from him. And it's been a huge, like, step forward for him to actually acknowledge Goku is kind of the superior fighter at this point. I mean, he is, but the fact that Vegeta acknowledged that is huge. And now he's kind of self-sacrificing and not really acting, I would say, entirely in his own interest by setting up Goku for the for the win. Like, yeah, his it definitely helps his pride to be able to step in and help out. But it's not just about him at this point. It's he seems to be thinking with a uh, more than just himself in mind. One hundred percent. I mean, this is beyond them just just using the the fusion earlier. This is about as much teamwork as we're gonna see out of these two Saiyans for quite some time. But Vegeta goes in, does transform into Super Saiyan this time. Thank just God. want to point that out. <laughs> and he goes in with the the. Uh, Vegeta, daka 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 daka. As he just... favorite attack. That's my favorite <laughs> attack. Just throw a bunch of key blasts. Works every time. Yep, and it clearly does work. And by that I mean, Boo gets out of it and kicks Vegeta in the back of the head. There's like, Vegeta just gets a beat down here, man. Like I really like the animation where they show. I think you pointed this out before, Dayton, but they show. Vegeta's eyes are almost like whited out. You can just barely see the outlines of his irises and he gets like knocked hard into the dirt. It's savage. Yeah. Um, I do have one. I love this scene by the way. So, um, just Vegeta being brutalized, but I do have one big critique because I have to critique it. Um, this is Vegeta fires off a final flash here and it is like the worst final flash I think I've ever seen. Does he? Re I didn't even realize that he fired off a final flash. Uh, yeah, it's. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the um, Big Bang attack. This is oh! the Big Bang attack. My bad. No, he no, fires no. off the Big Bang attack, and it, it. I mean, it doesn't even look like a regular key blast. It's so pathetic. You're right. Yeah, the Big Bang attack. He does fire off, and I. I think in one of not long ago in one of the previous fights, he fired off a Big Bang attack. That was a beam, and I think you and I kind of talked about this and pointed it out. This one is a beam too. It's very strange to me. I'm, I'm ninety nine percent certain the original Big Bang attack is when he's fighting Android uh, nineteen. Got to get the numbers right. The big white doughy Android, and he finishes his off Android nineteen with. You know, his thumb is kind of folded in on the hand and fires a ball energy attack as the Big Bang attack. All the other ones that we've seen since then have been beams and they look not on top of <laughs> not being the original attack. They look not good. Yeah. And Big Bang attack. I don't know. It's a fun name. I don't, I, I don't know why I like it, but it's just like, I don't know. Like, it's not his final move. It's not his, his top tier move. But it's just a big bang attack. I don't know. It's fun. It should be fun. But instead, I I don't know. I kind of get disappointed now when I think about it. Yeah, it's a bummer. I mean, Boo completely dodges the beam, uh, just kind of like folding his body around it. And then Boo continues 
the onslaught of just whooping Vegeta's ass. The cool thing, though, here is that despite how much his ass gets whooped, I mean, he's bloody, he's wounded, he's broken, but he's not giving up. And we see him kind of dragging himself out of, like, this crater as Boo's trying to walk towards Goku and just, like, he's not letting him. He's not letting him get away from him, and he's not letting this fight end at this point. And so Vegeta's putting everything on the line, even though he's got nothing left in the tank at this point. Absolutely. I want to point out, too, the this right before the scene you're talking about where Vegeta's in the crater is... I mean, the visceral beating is great, but there's a a shot where Boo grabs Vegeta by his Super Saiyan hair and then places a hand right in front of Vegeta's face, like inches away, and blasts him in the face. And when Vegeta gets out of that crater that you were describing, he's no longer in Super Saiyan form. His face is covered in blood. But like you said... He is the Saiyan Prince, and he full-on taunts Boo and is like, Motherfucker, get back here. I'm gonna whoop your ass. Well, um, I'm, I'm struggling to remember here, Todd. Um, Vegeta's buying all this time. I think it's been about a minute. Um, so Goku should be charged up at this point, right? Everything should be, everything should be hunky-dory? Yeah, should be hunky-dory. Except all of our people kind of watching the fight, they're like, What's taking so long? And Goku, even himself, is basically like, something's wrong. This isn't this isn't working. And despite Vegeta kind of continuing to get his ass beat, uh, Goku, I think at this point, basically says, "This it, there's maybe something about the fact that I'm the last time that I used Super Saiyan three was when I was dead, and so." using it in a not dead body because remember that the grand supreme kai gave his life for goku to come back uh super saiyan 3 is now draining his energy rather than him kind of being able to charge it up yeah and i mean while goku's going through like this internal like explanation i mean vegeta is being choked he's being slammed he's being electrocuted which is something new um I mean, hope is kind of is at its lowest at this point. And Goku's thinking about diving back into the fight, even though he's not ready. But thankfully, the real hero of Earth appears. And from off screen, from the top of the turnbuckle, baby, play the Stone Cold Steve <laughs> Austin music because Mr. Satan has just appeared. And he's got some smack talk worthy of the world champ that he's going to deliver. And he tags in and he prepares for battle. And that brings us straight into episode 161, an inspired strategy, make two wishes come true. It absolutely does. And diving into what I think is probably the best story arc in the entire Boo arc, or the best character <laughs> arc, Mr. Satan is here to, he's going to try to deliver the SmackDown. This, the start of this episode is incredible to me because... Kid Boo goes on the offensive. He basically takes a swipe at Mr. Satan. Uh, but there's this, just this brief moment of hesitation. And it's just enough that Boo, despite his vast speed, uh, misses Mr. Satan as Mr. Satan kind of like bows into a grovel at Boo's feet. And then Kid Boo goes to try to stomp on his head. And Mr. Satan kind of like leans back as if he's like praying his hands together. Um, kind of like, basically apologizing and asking for his life. And we, <laughs> Goku is while watching this basically says like, Oh wow. Mr. Satan's dodging all of Boo's attacks. I must've really underestimated. Him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is everyone shocked that he's not just paced on the ground right now? Yeah. 100%. Uh, but <laughs> we kind of find that this is like Boo starts grabbing his head. Like he's in pain. We're kind of, as the audience, we know that Mr. Satan had this relationship with Boo, so there's something internally going on with this struggle with Kid Boo still about harming Mr. Satan. Yeah, he's grabbing his head, and it looks like he has this insane migraine. And, I mean, and this goes on for a moment before we see Kid Boo, it, he just stops, and you see what almost looks like a moment of clarity in his eyes. And we see him kind of hawk back and Fire out this big gross spit wad that flies out and then poofs 
into the big fat Majin Buu that we all know and love. But like you said, we as the audience know of their relationship between Majin Buu, fat Majin Buu, and Mr. Satan. And so without this uh, relationship inside Kid Buu's body, um, those attachments are gone now. There's nothing holding Kid Buu back. Yeah, I I had to stop and think about this for a little bit, too, because we got to see Goku and Vegeta, specifically Vegeta, rip Fat Boo out of, at the time, what was Super Boo's body. Um, I thought, I'm pretty sure that Vegeta or maybe Goku, one of them, was carrying the pod that held Fat Boo in it. Now, the thing is... I I couldn't remember if when they like went out the exhaust port, uh, if they had Fat Boo's pod with them. Clearly, they must not have because it remained in Boo's body. I just kind of forgot that that was a detail that they they must have left the pod inside of Boo's body. Yeah, because we we know Majin Boo was cut loose, and that's basically what turned Super Boo into Kid Boo. Um. So I don't it, the whole absorbing people and how it works and why you can shrink and go. I, that is an entire universe of questions that I'm not going to get into. So <laughs> I'm just going to go with, all right, he must've just been rolling around inside there. And that was enough to influence kid boo. So he was able to just kind of fish him out from his teeth or whatever, and just get rid of him. Yeah, pretty much. He was a little, little morsel in the back of his mouth, but uh, this turns into uh, Mr. Satan kind of being like, ah, oh, buddy, boo. And then, you know, he's, he, he's ready to square off. He actually throws a few attacks at Kid Boo, uh, to which Kid Boo responds by punching him in the face. And I mean, props to Mr. Satan here to, for not fucking dying immediately by getting hit by boo. Um, he, he's gotta be decently strong, right? He's taking a hit from cell. He's taking a hit from Kid Boo. Like, He's got to have a little bit of power in there. Yeah, I mean, it, it proves he's at least pretty tough. And I mean, I like him holding his ground here, too, because he's he's looking down on the ground and he's seeing his unconscious friend Majin Buu. And that that's kind of what holds him there. That's kind of what keeps him from just running at this point. And not only is it, I guess you could say, strength of jaw, but he's showing some strength of character at this point because he's acting for something outside of himself at this point. He's willing to put his life on the line for, I mean, arguably um, somebody who I don't think anybody in the world would mind if they were killed. That's a really, really good point to point out is that, yeah, Mr. Satan is probably the only person that would stand up for our fat boo or Majin boo at this point. Um, who, admittedly, Mr. Satan throughout this entire sequence is basically saying like, oh, it's just a dream. This is too crazy. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and I mean, the funny part is, is kind of the way he's knocking around uh, Kid Boo's knocking around Mr. Satan. He's actually mildly entertained by this. I think it's kind of like like it probably feels good to get those cuffs off your hands and actually be able to act on this person you've been probably trying to kill for a long time now. Yeah, which is kind of funny. He does almost treat Mr. Satan like a plaything. However, Mr. Satan is saved as our Fat Boo gets up, firing a key blast between them, kind of deterring Kid Boo. And now it's about to be some Boo on Boo action as we get the two taffy bodied creatures beating the shit out of each other. <laughs> yep, it's a Boo on Boo battle as Majin Boo and Kid Boo begin to go at it. And we see Goku struggling to maintain his form and kind of keep his energy together. And he even goes so far as to drop out of Super Saiyan 3 back into his base form with the black hair. And this is where he mentions that um, something's wrong and that charging up isn't actually gaining him energy. He's actually losing energy. And this is where we get that explanation that uh, it's easier to maintain Super Saiyan 3 form when you're dead, which... Sure, I, 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 I don't know. I'll just take right. your word for it. 
it's yeah it's a little bit weird and I, I might have jumped the gun on the explanation for that part but yeah wait to point out though too he doesn't he basically falls out of super saiyan 3 right like it's involuntary it's not like he was trying to power down to conserve energy uh he this this part was a little bit weird to me too maybe because of the original funimation dub where they kind of express in both versions, the the new Kai dub and the original Funimation dub, that Super Saiyan 3 is difficult to maintain in a living body. It's easier in a, a dead body, effectively. But there was an additional detail in the original Funimation dub where they basically expressed that dead bodies are also more durable, uh, which was one of you the know details... What? I... The moment you said that, I was like, they did say something like that in the original. I forgot about that. Yeah, that is a thing. They kind of, well, they they don't say that at all in Kai, actually. It might have been a dubism. It might have been a detail that was added into the dub. Uh, and maybe that's why they, they cut it for the Kai dialogue. I just thought that that was interesting because that's that's actually one of the reasons that they expressed in the original dub as to why vegeta was even able to withstand the beating that boo gave him i mean i would just buy something like that it's kind of like all right like this is my soul and so there's a little bit more guard to it than just my fleshy body yeah i i agree with you not to mention the fact that like they said if you die when you're dead you're gone. You're wiped out from existence. So I could see there being like this element of like, okay, these, these dead people or these souls are more durable. So that doesn't happen. Yeah. I forgot about that. That's a good call up, but I mean, I do like that while Goku's going through all this kind of contemplation and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, Majin Buu is just getting his crap kicked in by Kid Buu in the background. And I mean, <laughs> Things are looking pretty dire at this point, but Vegeta actually uses his freaking brain at this point. And <laughs> this is where he just kind of screams out loud, asking if the Supreme Kai is watching, which of course he is and actually responds. And he requests that they go to Namek and collect the Dragon Balls. When Goku asks what his plan is, Vegeta cryptically set, asks Goku how many times he has saved the Earth and isn't it time the Earth shouldered some of the weight for themselves? I'm so glad you wrote that line down because that is an incredible line, especially coming from Vegeta uh, as his... I mean, we, we've we kind of like almost closed out his story arc here, but this is just kind of like adding sprinkles on top of that beautiful, beautiful cake that is his storyline. And he's coming up with a plan. He basically says like, okay get the Dragon Balls on Namek. I want you to wish back Earth, and I want you to wish back all of the people who died on Earth, or maybe it doesn't say on Earth, all of the people who died as of, from the day of the World Martial Arts Tournament onward, except for the bad people. Uh, and he quickly expresses, like, Goku's kind of like, that's it's more complicated than it needs to be. Why don't you just wish back the people who killed Boo? And I love this detail because Vegeta says, if I did that, it wouldn't bring back all of those innocent people that I killed during the World Martial Arts Tournament. Yeah, and I mean, it's such good attention to detail and it really shows you how much Vegeta thinks about these things, right? It's his, his tactical brain is going into overdrive to figure out a solution to all this stuff. And on top of that, it's also kind of him, I guess, redeeming himself from his earlier actions. So yes. when he had the internal monologue at the tournament, it was all evil, petty, jealous thoughts. And now he's having um, the completion of his story arc where he's trying to make up for the shortcomings he had earlier. I mean, it's it's a great arc. 100 percent that's that's i mean you're expressing a lot of the reasons why i really really like his arc here but that it turns out that the the namekians so basically <laughs> sorry this is crappy the hell <laughs> just... this is kind of funny i want to hear your take on this too uh the the kais basically teleport to namek to new namek with dende and 
they're basically like, hey guys, we need the Dragon Balls. And the Namekians are like, hey, we got all the Dragon Balls. They're right here. <laughs> I mean, they were like, oh, we were watching, so we already grabbed them. I'm like, okay, <laughs> cool. I can, I can imagine that. And <laughs> there's this moment where, uh, where Dende panics because he's just like, oh shoot, that's right. The Namekian dragon can only revive one person. And like the new Grand Elder's like, no, bro, we upgraded him. He can revive infinite people now. <laughs> uh, I, like, why Why wouldn't you have just had that programmed in there before? Why, why is that an upgrade you added? Late? And also there's no cost to it. You still get all your wishes. That is, man... I love Dragon Ball so much. That detail that you just described that happens multiple times throughout <laughs> Dragon Ball is possibly my least favorite part about Dragon Ball, where they just come up with new rules and get rid of the limitations that they have. Uh, I mean, this happens for things like the, the hyperbolic time chamber as well, where you're only supposed to be able to go in there for two days. They fucking get rid of that. Uh, but they also get rid of the limitations on the Dragon Balls specifically. Like, the the Earth Dragon Balls originally could only grant one wish, then they get two, and then I think eventually three. Uh, the Namekian Dragon Balls could only bring back one person per wish, as far as reviving people. And then they're like, yeah, we got rid of that. They're better now. Yeah, it's infinity people now, so that's minor upgrade. A little tune-up over here. I... I hate it so much. <laughs> I, oh. I hate it because death is already not very meaningful in Dragon Ball. And you're getting rid of the limitations on the things that bring people back from death and making it even even more meaningless. <laughs> yeah, just the fact that we can get the Dragon Ball so quickly now. There's more than one set of them. They have more wishes. It's I mean, these things are over to they need a nerf like ASAP. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll have to talk about that when we get to GT. But in the moment, they've got these Namekian Dragon Balls with three wishes that they can just wish back infinite people. And that's pretty much what they're going to do here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that leads us into episode 162. Share your spirit energy with me. I'm making a huge spirit bomb. I like how matter of fact that episode name is. <laughs> uh, just spoiling all the details. But oh. <laughs> uh, before we get those details, we basically get Paranga being summoned on Namek. And uh, all the, all, while all this is happening, the boos are fighting, but they're going to kind of enact Vegeta's plan here. And Dende wishes for Earth to come back and wishes for all those people to be brought back. And it takes a little bit of time because it's a big wish. But with our tuned up Paranga, he basically makes both of those things happen. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm skipping any details, Dayton, but I think this basically culminates in Vegeta basically revealing his big plan, which is the title of this episode. It's spirit bomb time. Okay. So there's a few um, flavor notes that I really like um, during the Paranga scene. What yeah. is the elder Kai commenting on how the dragon balls break the natural order and him just kind of like lamenting their existence. And I agree with him. So I have to comment on that. He's correct. I'm pro elder Kai. He's, he's, he's right on topic here. He's right on point. I'm on board on, with that. And then on top of that, I love that when Dende's going through the motions of summoning the dragon and making the wishes, he has to speak some Namekian and he kind of is like, all right, I, yeah, I think I remember how to do this. Like, okay, I'm a little rough on it. I think I said that right. And I like this because Dende was, was a really small kid when he came to earth. And so he learned that language when he was very, very young and it's been over 10 years since um, since he's been back to Namek or even spoke any Namekian, probably. And so I like that little detail of, yeah, I think I remember, and just him trying to like think about it and hoping he's saying things right. It's such a small detail, but it it's one of those ones that when he said it, I was like, oh, yeah, that does make sense. 
It's a cool detail. I actually, uh, kind of the way that I interpreted it to the way that it's portrayed is that Dende does say some Namekian, and then we kind of get it, of course, for our perspective in English. It kind of feels like they're giving us like, okay, he's speaking Namekian, but here's effectively the translation that he's asking for so that everybody understands what's going on. So it's it's really well done. I really liked the presentation in that way. Yeah, and uh, getting back to your point where Vegeta kind of reveals his plan, this is where that kind of cryptic, like, you know, maybe the Earth should shoulder its own weight comes into play here. Um, Vegeta specifically did these things in this order so that way he could bring back the Earth and its people and then use their energy to form that spirit bomb so that way the planet can, quote unquote, finally stand for itself. And um, so Vegeta needs to get his message out to the people to ask them for their energy. And we find out that the Elder Kai isn't capable of broadcasting Vegeta's message, which is funny because a eavesdropping King Kai is capable and offers to lend his hand. I do love that. Like the, the Kais are like, Oh no, we can't do that. Uh, but King Kai's like, Hey guys, that's kind of my specialty. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it's great too, because it's one, you love seeing old characters kind of come in and play a role like that. Two, everyone loves King Kai. And if you don't, then you're wrong. Um, and yes. three, I don't know. It, it's just one of those little details that makes you think like, all right, well, why would King Kai be able to do it? But like a Supreme Kai can't do it. And it's just like, well, maybe it's kind of like their roles in the natural order where, you know, King Kai is actually managing populations, whereas maybe the Grand Kais are kind of more managing the lower Kais and then universal threats. So they don't need that capability or don't learn it. That's a that's a good thought. I I also like the idea that it just to add to that that it kind of plays into their character designs too where King Kai specifically is drawn to look he he almost looks a little bit like a bug but he has these big ass antenna like he's a fucking satellite dish in human form so like it it's cool that they specifically thought about that for his character design as well uh, I do want to point out one other thing here before we move forward, because this is kind of hilarious to me, uh, but they, I think maybe Vegeta or somebody, somebody basically expresses the spirit bomb is our last hope. It's the last way that we can finish off Kid Boo. And I kind of get a laugh out of that because throughout this, as we see the people who got wished back from Earth, or wish back on earth from being dead we kind of see like goten trunks but specifically we see gohan and so in my head i could not get the thought out of my head that goku could just be like pop over to earth hi gohan i need your help pop back over to the world of the kais and be like all right son solve this problem for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that <laughs> That's definitely an option. Um, <laughs> hmm. I guess when you put that into perspective, uh, I'm going to ignore you said that, actually. It's much more <laughs> enjoyable when I don't think about that. I mean, Gohan, I, uh, Gohan's way stronger than Goku in Super Saiyan 3 form, honestly. Like, I'm, there's no doubt in my mind that Gohan could whoop the shit out of Kid Buu. <laughs> well, and part of me is like, like, think... Beating Boo is only in contention right now because Vegeta and Goku were too prideful and arrogant to just use the damn Patara earrings. And on top of that, they destroyed them rather than giving them back. So they're not even on the table now. So it's like, you guys are saying that if you don't win, the universe deserves to be destroyed. Like, <laughs> I get it. It's in their character to be like, we don't want like, like shortcuts. But maybe someone else does. Maybe the rest of the universe would like a shortcut to living. I don't know. Yeah, I love that you pointed out that they they destroyed them. I I didn't quite catch that detail when we went through it, but that's hilarious that they just got rid of them. It's also just kind of a jerk move. They could have just handed them back. Yeah, that's that's also true. I don't know. There's a few details in here that are just like this feels a little bit weird, maybe just kind of funny, but I'm okay with it for the narrative that we're going to get here. Well, speaking of uh narrative that's I think in line with character and funny, is Vegeta gets his microphone to the entire planet, right? And he's giving this message, asking everyone for their energy and talking about their fight with Boo. And it's it's actually at first kind of not a bad message, but then he punctuates it with like, I don't care what you think or feel, just do it. 
And that's not a very good exiting note when you're asking people for help. It's funny, though. It's so funny. And it's so in character. Like, Vegeta has gone through his arc. He's kind of figured out, like, oh, you know, my way of doing things is not always the best way. And maybe Kakarot's way of doing things has some validity to it. But that doesn't change him completely as a person. He's still a bit of a brash, kind of rough around the edges uh, saying and social graces are certainly not his strong suit. I mean, this is still a giant leap forward for him, though, right? Like, he's actually asking people for help and trying to, like, get some teamwork going on here. Absolutely. Which is why I like this, because it is a giant step forward, but it's not too far forward where I feel like it seems ridiculous or out of character. Uh, I, I like that he... He has this great idea, he's willing to ask for help, but he's not good at doing that. Yeah, and um, as a result, the spirit bomb begins forming, and um, yeah, it's not forming as quickly as it should be. And Goku even yells at Vegeta that the, the bomb is not really, like, getting bigger. And so our heroes are tuned into the Earthling's kind of response to Vegeta's call, and they mostly think that he's just a crazy guy. And this, of course, infuriates uh, Vegeta. But at the same time, do you blame the Earthlings, considering the last time a voice was in their head, it was the evil wizard Bobbity who was terrorizing the planet? Like, why the hell would you listen to that noise? I think that's even pointed out in the narrative here by somebody, too, which is a, a great detail. And <laughs> Vegeta basically goes in for round two now that he realizes that the earthlings are not uh they're not offering up their energy and so he goes in for round two of speaking to them and basically just starts screaming at them like you're all gonna die if you don't raise your hands up and give us your energy <laughs> yeah and king kai had tried to tell him to kind of relax and ask more nicely and this is this is kind of what we get is Vegeta is now on full display. He's not hiding it. He's infuriated. And I mean, he can't figure out why planet Earth isn't sympathetic to their own fate right now. Why they're not playing along. And like they know who Boo is and they're fighting him. Like it's just not making sense to Vegeta because he's kind of an all logic brain, but also kind of an all me brain. So he's. He's not able to project his emotions out too far. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, this is like... It's not like the situation with Cell, where it was being broadcast on television. Uh, people, uh, people could watch the fight. People could see it with their eyes happening. This is just some voice speaking in your head. Like, you're, you're now... You've, you've been resurrected, uh, which... Who knows what that feels like to all these people on Earth, but they could feel like, oh, you know, maybe that was a weird, the whole Boo stuff was a weird fever dream. Maybe they believe the Boo stuff, but they don't see the immediate threat of Boo. They just hear this voice telling them that they are fighting Boo, uh, this voice that they don't know or recognize. So I would honestly probably do the same thing. Like, what are you supposed to think about that? It's such a weird situation. Well, they're not going to get a lot of time to think about that because Majin Buu's resilience to Kid Buu's beating seem to be running out at the end of this episode, which brings us into episode 163. You are the savior of the world. Everybody's spirit bomb completed. And we see Vegeta kind of bites lip, hunkers down, and lets loose the word please in his final gambit to try and get the Earth to play along. And it works a little bit. I I love this. I mean, I know that we we said like Vegeta recognizing Kakarot as you know being better than him and everything was kind of like punctuating his story. But there's these these little like breadcrumbs that just continue to deliver on that story. Uh, so just the fact that Vegeta is willing to ask for help is incredible. The fact that he said he says please. He literally says I'm begging you please give up your energy so that we can defeat boo uh crazy wild thing for him to say that he never would have said in a million years before this the cool thing though too that to add on to that 
is we get to see, and this is a really cool element as we're wrapping up Dragon Ball Z, is we get to see these figures who were a part of Goku's story early on. People that he had a big impact on their life Probably when, I mean, for the most part, when he was a child, like we get to see Ader, Android 8, uh, back from the original Dragon Ball. Oh, we get to his see... old friends kind of responding to Goku's call for help. Yeah, exactly. Maybe I'm jumping the gun here. Maybe this is after Goku expresses, because uh, I think he gets a chance to talk to uh, Earth, doesn't he? Yeah. So, um, so we get a shot of um, uh, Mr. Satan. He's seeing his his Majin friend being kind of beat up right now. Right. And he actually steps in to try and remove kid boo from his buddy. And all this does is it draws attention to Goku and the spirit bomb he's holding. And this is where Goku realizes he's in trouble and he needs that energy right now because Vegeta is forced to step out and buy some more time at this point. And Vegeta doesn't really have anything in the tank. So this is where Goku, he screams out and he's begging earth for their energy and this is where we get, I believe it was Upa was the name of the, uh, the, the native tribe. Um, they recognize Goku's voice and they give their energy. We get Ader and the snow village and we get, we get so many familiar faces. All, all these people that Goku touched in his original Dragon Ball series journeys. And it's kind of a quick flash through of, of all these old characters that you may have forgotten about at this point. This is really cool. I want to dig into this just a little bit more because Upa and his father Bora, they show both of them, but Upa is all grown up. He's like a jacked dude at this point. Uh, and they are quick to offer up their energy when they hear Goku's voice. Like you said, Ader and Suno uh, from the, the Snow Village. One that I love in here is android 17 and it's i mean it's such a brief shot but it shows him with like a gun uh, holding up what looks to be these poachers and he has a great line because he points the gun at these poachers who raise their hands up into the air and he's like oh good yeah i want i was thinking about doing that too and he raises his hand up to <laughs> offer up the energy <laughs> it's such a good line and oh, last hold I on hold on quick question yeah, yeah yeah what does raising your hands and donating energy do when you're an android and have unlimited energy <laughs> <laughs> did, we, did we find an infinite combo is this does this break the game we have broken the universe. The spirit bomb should just continue to grow and grow and grow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, that's it. We we broke the game, guys. You don't need to drain anymore. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, something we're going to have to basically shut our brains off for for that. Already one. did, yep. but <laughs> but uh, the other, the last one I wanted to point out, and it again is a like a super brief shot. But a character who was basically forgotten about when we transitioned from Dragon Ball to Dragon Ball Z is Launch. Launch with her. Did she get off the bus? She got off the bus. I yeah. thought, okay, that stuck in my head. I was like, I recognize that character, but I don't remember why. Yeah, okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that is a throwback. That's such a good throwback. Like, she, she has not been seen in all of Dragon Ball Z, I'm almost certain. And so to throw her back in there, but just to throw, like... The important part here is we're getting to see all these people that Goku has touched their lives and see, I mean, we're going to kind of see this going forward, but the idea is that because Goku has touched so many people's lives, that becomes his power in this moment, quite literally, as they offer up their energy to his spirit bomb. I love what's kind of happening to the backdrop of this too, as Gohan, Goten... Uh, Trunks and Piccolo all decide that they're going to do some groundwork to try and help out as well by just telling people that, you know, to give your energy to try and convince people. And Goten and Trunks, like, end up on a farm and they're, like, eating corn. They're not very helpful. No <laughs> one's listening to Gohan. Um, and all that happens with uh, Piccolo is that people recognize him as the Demon King Piccolo and just flee the scene as soon as they see him. It's perfect. I love it. I got such a good laugh out of that scene with Piccolo. I was dying. I, I totally forgot about that, but it makes absolute sense that people are just like terrified because 
Demon King Piccolo tried to take over the world. <laughs> and he he killed a lot of people, man. Like, he was wiping out entire cities. He's probably one of the biggest first big threat that they the Earth had probably ever experienced. At least it feels like that. Yeah. Yeah. At least from, from our perspective, from what we know of, for sure. Uh, but we kind of continue forward as... Fat Boo kind of gets knocked out of the fight at this point. I think we kind of glossed over it, but it's nothing super significant. But Vegeta has to jump back into the fight against Kid Boo. Uh, Kid Boo now recognizing the danger that is the spirit bomb that Goku is charging and kind of like moves forward to attack him. But Vegeta is able to at least hold Kid Boo off, uh, just kind of like blasting him and keeping him away from Goku for the moment. Yeah. And Goku's frustrated at this point because once again, their their call for help was ignored. And he even yells at the planet once more, even calling them dumbasses, which is, I mean, that's a big boy word that I'm not used to hearing in, in Dragon Ball. And Mr. Satan's kind of listening to all of this. And we see him kind of just yell out in frustration to like to help. And how dare they defy Mr. Satan? And to his surprise, they actually hear him. And this is where our guy kind of steps in and the champ kind of shows what he's worth because he begins just buttering up Earth's population, just getting them to go along with the plan, telling them that the champ is on scene and that, you know, if you raise your hands, he's going to save the day. And we start going through the streets and people are, I mean, they're lifting their arms, they're chanting Satan's name, and they begin the ritual. This could be the best character arc in the Boo arc. <laughs> it's so fucking good. Because <laughs> uh, this whole time you're thinking he's kind of like a gag. And then you're like, all right, he's a gag, but he's also like kind of a, you know, a relatable character. He's kind of a fun character, whatever. And then now it's like, oh, wow, he's actually playing a major role. So we have to stop and talk about this, about the fact that Mr. Satan took the credit for defeating Cell when, you know, effectively it was Goku and Gohan, essentially Gohan, but uh, between the two of them, they beat Cell and Mr. Satan got all the credit for it. All the, the fame, the riches, the accolades, the status, he took all of that. And, you know, I think as as the audience, you're kind of supposed to be like, oh, fuck that guy. He's, you know, he's a jerk. Like, he he didn't do anything, and he got all this this recognition for doing nothing. He kind of stole all of those things. And now here, because he got those accolades and he stole that status, he uses that status to... Uh, the status of, you know, the savior of Earth, which he clearly was not... He uses that status as the savior of Earth to truly become the savior of Earth against Majin Buu. Incredible writing. Unbelievably good story arc. Yeah, and I mean, I don't... Man, I don't know if this was his plan for his character this whole time, but I mean, if it was, that is a lot of foresight to go from Cell, this, this throwaway character who you're probably annoyed with the first time you meet him, to instrumental in saving the the universe from a universal threat. And I mean, it's funny because when you think about it, if, if say Gohan got credit for saving the planet, I don't think he would have wanted that. I think it would have been more of a hindrance of his life. So in a weird way, and I think I may have mentioned something similar to this before it's, he's kind of doing them a favor by taking all the credit because now they can live normal lives and they can continue to do the things behind the scenes that they've been doing. Right. Like if the paparazzi were always at your house and following you around and accosting your family, I don't think Vegeta would be down for that. I think the, he would be the, the threat to the planet at that point. So <laughs> it's one of those things where in a weird way, everything's kind of worked out in the best possible scenario. I mean, to your point, we kind of see that at the beginning of the Boo arc with Gohan, right? Because Gohan even goes so far as to take on this superhero persona of the great Saiyaman. And he he specifically says it's because he doesn't want 
the attention that it would draw if people are like, oh, you have superhuman powers and they start, you know, like you said, get paparazzi, people follow him home, people are just effectively harassing him because he's got these powers. So, yeah, I mean, in a way, Mr. Satan is doing our Z fighters a favor. <laughs> and it's not like um, it's not like this lie came scot free. There are plenty of moments where he kind of internally thinks about how he's kind of a fraud and it's kind of a sham and it could be up at any moment sort of thing. So there probably is some weight to his conscience for for keeping that secret sort of thing. There's a little bit there, and it it probably does add up over time. But in this moment, it pays off hugely as we watch dozens, thousands, millions of people on Earth begin raising their hands up and giving their energy to the spirit bomb in the name of Satan. <laughs> Mr. Satan. Um. So the spirit bomb <laughs> balloons in size at this point, and... Finally, the bomb is ready, but we do have one major issue, and that's Vegeta's just battered and broken body is just thrown onto the ground near Kid Buu, the intended target of the bomb, and he can't move. He can't get out of the way, and as Goku's yelling at Vegeta to move, Kid Buu kind of, you know, pieces it together. It's not very hard, and he walks over and actually places a foot on top of Vegeta's body that just looks at Goku with this wicked smile and begins launching little key blasts into Goku's body. And Goku can't defend himself. His arms are up controlling the, the spirit bomb. Yeah, he's... I, I mean, this is like the, the last hurdle here where it's like, okay, it feels like we've got the energy for this, uh, but Goku doesn't want to doesn't want to sacrifice Vegeta. Now, we should also point out, Vegeta is alive. Thanks to the wish that brought everybody back, Vegeta no longer has the halo. So, I mean, they could kill him and bring him back, but I, I mean, just carelessly killing your friends and comrades is not a good way to go about living life, even if you can bring them back, right? Uh, also, this, this is such a strange little conversation if you're not completely in context where it's just like, well, no, he's alive now, so you can kill him now, but he wasn't alive earlier, so you couldn't kill him earlier. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds real strange when you look at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Goku's just taking these shots to the body. And we see our fat Majin Buu pull himself back to his feet. And he begins marching towards Kid Buu with this just pissed off look on his face. He even knocks Mr. Satan aside as he's all business right now. And I, man, I you know stuff is happening. Yeah, I mean... This is this is great as our fat boo kind of like lunges forward uh, at Kid Boo as Kid Boo is about to blast Goku with a big key blast. Fat boo tackles him, just bodily takes him down to the ground, knocking him off and away from Vegeta. And fat boo yells out at Mr. Satan, like, get him, get him out of here. <laughs> yeah. And. Mr. Satan grabs Vegeta and just scurries off scene. And everything is clear now. And this is where Goku finally launches the, not just spirit bomb, but the super spirit bomb. It's it's so big that the narrator even gave it a, a, a bigger name. <laughs> I, I also have to say, so I think one of the things that I really love about Dragon Ball Z over Dragon Ball Super is that Almost every scenario, like every bad guy that they fight, even though like people joke about the Z fighters always fight their fights one on one. If you look at every arc, almost every single bad guy that they beat is a group effort. This one included because Goku's on board uh, doing the spirit bomb. Vegeta's on board trying to buy time and make up the plan. Fat Boo is on board buying time and... Uh, knocking Boo, Kid Boo off of Vegeta, and Mr. Satan is on board, not only getting all the people of Earth to offer up their energy, but being the fucking hero and saving Vegeta in this moment. Yeah, and I mean, like, to go even further, the, you even had the new uh, Elder Kai and Supreme Kai get involved by teaming up with Dende and going over to meet some old friends on Namek to utilize their Dragon Ball. Like, 
there's a lot of things that are kind of coming into play and going into action. It's like, it's, I don't know. I love it. And you're right because there's, there's multiple instances of people playing like their role in the big fight. Like, yeah, sure. It might be the big fight might be between two people, but there's always a lot of background stuff that's going on to, to make it come together. And I mean, it makes it fun because you're just like, oh, shoot, this seed was planted earlier and I didn't think about that. And just like, I don't know, it's great. It's a lot of fun. And I like knowing that even if my guy, even if my favorite character isn't like the strongest, there's still a chance that he could play a role and do something cool. Yeah, we've even in this arc, we've had Krillin himself, your favorite guy, has had some some cool scenes. They've been brief, but still cool. So uh, this I think kind of takes us into the next episode with the spirit bomb getting launched. Yeah. Um, and episode 164 is up next. You really are the greatest Goku, the demise of Majin Buu. Um, thanks for telling me what's happening in this episode. Oh, boy. Uh, this one begins with Gohan. Gohan. Gohan, Goten. <laughs> Shouldn't put those two right next to each other. Uh, uh-huh. Gohan and Goten, Trunks and Piccolo, uh, regrouping after they and they sense the spirit bomb kind of in action they arrive at the lookout and there's kind of this little family reunion moment where the mothers and their kids so Bulma and Chi Chi reunite with their their children and we get this kind of very heartfelt hug from Videl with Gohan as they have like this is the first time they've seen each other in a while too and remember Videl was the one who kind of was able to sense that Gohan was still alive out there somewhere when when everyone else thought he was dead. So that there was a special connection that they've been building this entire time. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is a big moment for them. Unfortunately, it's going to be a little bit overshadowed yes. here as we're still following the fight between Goku and Boo and Goku's trying to push the spirit bomb on Boo. Boo's though pushing it back, like actively is walking the spirit bomb back towards Goku and even eventually using his own energy is pushing it out away from him back in Goku's direction. Yeah, and Goku's losing control. Vegeta picks up on this and he begins yelling at Mr. Satan to to ask for more energy from the planet. Like, we, we need more juice. And King Kai steps in and says, like, no, don't do that because if they if you take any more from them, you could take their lives. And this is right after you've just resurrected all of them. And Mr. Satan falls to his knees at this point because he's kind of, he's struggling with the guilt of like, do, do I help beat boo or do I take the lives of my adoring fans? And he kind of realizes that he couldn't do something that could hurt people. And so he refuses to ask. I love this. Uh, and again, I'm I'm going to gush over Mr. Satan's story here because he is the hero of Earth. He now he truly is becoming the hero of Earth, but in having that title, he's like I can't I can't take advantage of these people who love me. These people who look up to me as their savior and their hero. I know that you know, this this could mean everybody dies, but I, I'm not going to debase myself so far as to ask people to give their lives to save other lives. Like, man, that's like, ah, he's such a good hero character in this moment. I love that detail about him. It, it, it takes a character that, like, not long ago you probably would have hated, and it makes him really hard to hate. It really kind of reverses your your understanding of this this big blowhard right somebody who you probably would have made fun of up until i don't know halfway through uh the boo saga like it's yeah. crazy it's so good such good writing for his character but because mr satan is unwilling to ask people to give their lives in this moment they need another plan. Boo is pushing the spirit bomb back at Goku. Goku doesn't have enough power. He's out of energy. So ah, he can't... I see what you did there. Goku doesn't have enough power, huh? Well, <laughs> it's a good thing Vegeta <laughs> thinks quick because he just remembered that there's a third wish they still haven't used. And this is where Dende is used to ask the dragon to restore Goku's energy. So my favorite part about this scene is when Purunga gives the big, like, okay sign and says, 
okay. And then Git does the wish. <laughs> That is really good because it's just like it's just comical, like this big buff dragon. <laughs> um, but I mean, they they had this spare wish. It's it, it, there's a part. Hmm, I, I'm wondering if I should even bring this up. There's a part of me oh, that no. is like maybe they could have used this wish for something. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like. <laughs> yeah like it feels like this wish could have been used for something more meaningful it works out in the end uh and i i kind of like the way that it plays out but it still feels like you could have done something different with this or i don't know hey, regardless they give goku back his energy and he's able to basically power up into super saiyan and then push with all his power against boo to effectively deliver what's going to be the final blow to Kid Boo. Yeah, the spirit bomb is hurled back towards Boo, who who fights against it with all of his might, and he's even kind of pushed down into the dirt as he resists it. And Goku actually comments on their their struggle and how Boo, at every point, kind of got stronger and adapted and was kind of this opponent that just never stopped being a challenge. And he wishes that uh, someday he would come back again without all the evil so that way they can fight. That's important. That is going to be important. There is also a, a line in here that I want to kind of point out because it's from a meta level. It's very funny to me where Goku says uh, he's kind of like acknowledging Boo for, you know, changing all his power and stuff. But he says something to the effect of, you changed forms so many times that even I got sick of it, which is like, <laughs> kind of feels like it's right in line with the, how the audience feels about Boo. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, Frieza changed forms like a bunch of times, but I feel like with Boo, I needed like, I needed someone to sit me down and explain to me why the hell each transformation was happening because it was a complicated flow chart, man. At least Frieza was just a line. Yeah, Frieza's was easy, and Frieza's was like, okay, we're we're doing transformations. This is a new thing. Boo's complicated, man. I, I had to rack my brain through a lot of this stuff to be like, okay, I think I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that that is pretty funny. But the bomb hits, everyone cheers, um, and yeah. Uh, the dust settles and Boo does not regenerate, so he's finally been defeated. And kind of get the scene of Goku and Vegeta dropping to the planet's floor, just completely exhausted. I don't understand Goku. Why is he tired? He just got completely restored. <laughs> this is this is kind of a weird thing because we're about to see. Well, Dende basically comes in to heal them. You. <laughs> Because Dende heals Goku, I kind of get the impression that Goku is still damaged, like he's still beaten up, but he got his energy back, his power back, almost like delineating those two as two separate things, I guess. I don't know. It's it's weird. Yeah, I'll take your word for it. It was just one of those things where restore Goku's energy. And then he's like, after the battle, he's like, I'm tired. I'm like, no, you should be full of energy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and it's interesting, right? Because we get Goku and Vegeta kind of taking that moment when they're completely exasperated and they give each other a thumbs up, which is kind of funny. Um, it's, you know, Saiyan's bonding. I guess that's how they do it. Um, and we see that uh, Mr. Satan makes this announcement to Earth, and so everyone on Earth knows that Boo's defeated. Um, it's a good thing he does that, knowing what happens in not too long. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because the next thing that happens is they come across Majin Boo, Fat Boo, who is currently unconscious, but very much still alive. And there's this kind of moral dilemma of what do we do with this? Because Mr. Satan, of course, wants to help his friend. And Vegeta, of course, says this, your friend has killed countless people and a form of him blew up the freaking planet. So no, I'm going to vaporize him. And I kind of like these conflicting kind of ideas going at each other because me as an audience member, I'm like, 
yeah, Fat Boo's not so bad, but also, how does that thing, like, exist? So, it's it's a fun little dilemma, but eventually we come to the conclusion that um, Goku wants him to stay alive so we don't kill him. <laughs> and I mean, this is like, this is in line with, very in line with Goku's character, right? I mean, the funny thing is, if we want to draw some parallels here, is that Goku is basically saying, like, yeah, let let Boo live. Like, you know, uh, he's probably not that bad of a guy. This is, uh, while Vegeta's saying, like, let's kill him, this is exactly what Goku did for Vegeta at the very beginning of this series. <laughs> oh, that is funny. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just the, the tables are a little bit different this time. And yeah. Really interestingly, Mr. Satan is standing between Vegeta and Vegeta's prey at this point. And that is a very brave place for anybody in the universe to be. Because, I mean, up till this point, Vegeta would probably just vaporize him and Majin Buu and not think twice about it. Mr. Satan is the fucking hero we deserve, man. I I also love that Vegeta is saying, like, if you don't get away from Boo, I will blast you. But you can tell from the way he's talking and his facial expressions that he's he's wavering. Like, he doesn't want to kill Mr. Satan. Yeah, and I mean, so we've decided that we're not killing Boo. Dende is going to get a patch back up. But the Supreme Kai, who's on scene, points out that uh, Boo can't really live on Earth at this point with all the crap he's done. And don't worry, uh, Goku has a plan, which is to use the Dragon Balls to erase everyone's memories of him. This feels, I mean, it works out in the end, but as much as I don't this like... This is the kind of garbage that I hate the Dragon Balls for. You exactly. don't actually have to solve this problem. Exactly, right. Like... I mean, this is how Goku basically gets Boo to be able to be part of the group and be able to live on Earth and everything. But yes, it it feels like a wild abuse of the Dragon Ball's powers. <laughs> oh man, like, like oh, we're just we're just gonna wish for this to not be a problem. Which don't get me wrong, we do that with a lot of things, and I'm critiquing this show because we do it with too many things. But this just feels like. I mean, this feels like blatant abuse. This feels like going a limb too far where it's like, okay, like if anything, this was just a narrative thing that you could have maybe have written some cool lore for or done something for. But instead, we we just want to make sure that this plot hole is gone. So we're going to wish it away. Yeah, that's frustrating to me. I mean, Fat Boo can change his form pretty, pretty easily. Like he could have easily made himself look like something different, like... There's lots of other ways that this could have been solved without hand waving it with Dragon Balls. Oh, I don't know. I, it's so, for some reason it just bothers me, but I won't pine on it anymore. Um, we see Goku, Vegeta, Dende, and Hercule all head to the lookout and reunite with everybody. Um, there's some hugs between the families. It's great. Uh, and Goku announces that his life has been restored thanks to Elder Kai, so he's here to stay this time around. Yeah, this is kind of cool. I do kind of like the moment of specifically Mr. Satan and Videl getting to meet each other again because Mr. Satan was told that his daughter was dead. And he he doesn't, I mean, outside of, you know, kind of being involved with the plan with Vegeta using the Dragon Balls and stuff, he didn't really know that she could be brought back to life necessarily. So that's a big deal in his in his eyes. Yeah, and I mean, it's we've spent so much time with with Hercule at this point that we we've seen his true character. We know he's not like a bad guy at this point. There's actually a lot of likable qualities, and so like you've come to appreciate Mister Satan. Then he comes back and you see him get like his hug with his daughter, sort of thing. You're just like, you know, yes. that guy deserves it. That guy deserves that hug. Absolutely, he definitely does. And we kind of come to the tail end of this episode as uh, we get. We're basically at Goku and Chi Chi's house in on Mount Paizu, the, and Goku is taking a bath in a basically in a barrel with the boys with Goten and Trunks, 
and they're kind of wrestling and fighting each other and Goten and Trunks use fusion to kind of get the upper hand on Goku and then Goku full on destroys the bath that they're in transforming into Super Saiyan and revealing his Saiyan buns to all of his friends and family. <laughs> yeah, just being the wild mountain man who just has no no manners, does not care about any of that stuff. Um and I mean, Vegeta's even kind of like lurking nearby, I think secretly kind of enjoying the camaraderie despite Goku's um rash na nature. Yeah, I mean, this is it's a fun moment. Like it it feels very feels like a Dragon Ball gag. It feels very in character and it's just like a, this pleasant wholesome moment after defeating a, the big bad guy. A great moment for the series to end, right? A great moment for us to really wrap things up. It's the bad guys beaten. We've had some character development and like Goku's reunited with his friends and family and everyone's just enjoying peacetime with their loved ones. What a great spot for us to end this on. Yeah, I guess we can end our coverage for Dragon Ball Z Kai on that note and finish up the episode. Oh, wait, hold on. My notes go a little further. Oh, God. All right, so this goes into episode 165. Peace <laughs> returns, a time of rest for the warriors. And I have like five bullet points. Um, They're quick ones. I don't know if you want me to just burn through them or if you want to cover anything in depth. I'll I'll pass it off to you if you want to do the the uh, quick play by play, and I might add in a note here and there. All right, I'll I'll do the quick ones, and then you fill in any gaps that I might have. Um, first and foremost, uh, Shenron is summoned, and Earth's memories are wiped, so that does happen. So, yep, all the boo stuff, no one even remembers. Uh, that's probably the biggest point out of all of this that I think we've already kind of discussed. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's kind of the the big keynote here. Um, we're basically just going to get a quick rundown of, like, Majin Buu in the city. None of that stuff really matters. We can kind of jump forward to the other stuff. Did you want to pick up with the... Do you have some more bullet points for um, this one? I mean, it's pretty much the same stuff. It's Buu learns about capitalism, then beats up a guy so he can buy ice cream. Gohan and Videl begin fighting crime as the great Saiyaman number one and two, which is adorable. Uh, Goku saves a nest and then Bulma throws a big party that everyone shows up to, but Goku is late because he wanted to watch eggs hatch. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I think the only thing that I even want to touch on for this episode is the tail end of it where Goku shows up to the party late and everybody, all of his friends are about ready to leave. And then everybody like stops uh, what they were doing. They, they stay at the party to engage with Goku. And I think that this just kind of shows how likable Goku is. Despite all of his faults, he finds some way to draw people in. He's very, he's very charismatic and very magnetic in that way. And I think that that, that part is important about this episode and probably like you said, probably the one detail at the beginning with the, the wish and that little detail at the end are probably the only two important parts here. <laughs> yeah, it's the rest of it is it's it's pretty much a filler episode. Um, And it's not even like the type of filler episode where you get great like character context moments. It's it, Goku watches a, a nest of eggs for pretty much the entire episode. So, yeah. That's that one. Um, yep. That leads us into episode 166. And so, 10 years later, a long-awaited world martial arts tournament. And uh, just like the title says, uh, 10 years have passed, and we get our first shot of was a now a teenage-slash-young adult Trunks looking for Goten. Um, we see Chi-Chi, who looks like she's living happily somewhere nice. Um, Gohan and Videl are married at this point, and they live in a big, beautiful home with their daughter, Pan. And yeah, Gohan points to Trunks that uh, points out to Trunks that Goten is probably back in the mountains uh, training with Goku. And I like this note because I was just like, oh, hell yeah, Goku's training his youngest son. And Goten has always been kind of like presented as very much like a young Goku. And so I love this dynamic of like, all right, you know, Gohan's going to be the brainiac, probably take after TT more in some ways. Goku's going to train Goten because they're much more similar. And so that's kind of a cool dynamic. I'm kind of curious to hear your take on how you feel that was presented because 
I don't feel like we get that from Goten that he's like a big fighter necessarily. In fact, when the concept of the World Martial Arts Tournament comes up, I think presented by Goku uh, as Vegeta and Balma kind of show up on the scene and Trunks as well, uh, Goku says that Goten either should or is going to participate and Goten's like, Ah, oh, Dad, I was supposed to have a date tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, my my disappointment was immediate. Um, and it only gets worse. But yeah, we do find out that there's the the big martial arts tournament tomorrow, and that uh, everyone's gonna enter. And uh, okay, so there's one thing that I want to point out during this scene that's very relevant because of what happens in Super. Um, none of it important though. Uh. <laughs> Uh, Bulma comments on how weird it is that, like, the Saiyans aren't aging, and Goku responds with, like, well, that's because she's just a wrinkly old lady now, and Bulma retorts with, uh, threatening to use the Dragon Balls to wish for youth, which does happen in Super. That is, I actually like that detail that Bulma does that in Super now, because I didn't realize this was something in, at the end of, uh, the Boo series. So the interesting thing, though, here to point out oh. is that, well, this is after this this episode, this 10 year gap is after everything that's happened into Super up to this point. Oh, so none of this is canon. Well, uh, well, uh, yes. <laughs> um, Super has kind of been in this weird space where it's been confined with this this little arc, this like two episode arc, if you want to call it that, is what people call the end of Z arc, uh, after the, like the 10 year time gap, uh, super has kind of had to confine itself to try to match up to the end of Z arc. I, I think the way that she says that to me, the way I'm going to rationalize it in my head, because we know that prior to this, she would have had to have used the, the dragon balls to wish herself to look younger, that she's not going to own up to and admit to using the dragon balls. And she's going to kind of like use it as a threat here, even though secretly she's been using the dragon balls for that exact wish. Okay. So remind Kai though, was came out before dragon ball super came out though. Right. Yes. The, the boo arc might've come out kind of simultaneously with super like the boo arc came out in, 2014 2015 and super started in 2015 which is why they share some music so when super did the wishes for youth it was kind of to give context to this comet maybe Ooh, uh, it could be could be it, it i think that that would have that part of super would have come out after the end of z in kai was written and dubbed and everything okay so there's some sort of continuity happening between Super and this comment, I feel. I just, I'm not exactly sure how it all fits together, but there's something there. Yeah, definitely. I also want to point out, because you were talking about the continuity with those, the, the detail that we mentioned with Goten about the dating thing is actually, I'm almost certain this one is actually a direct tie-in to Goten in GT, where he is like a ladies' man and dating all oh. the women. I haven't seen GT, so I'm excited to see Goten uh, to work his magic. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's pretty funny. Man, there's a lot going on here. Um, a lot of breadcrumbs that lead to, well, somewhere. But, yeah, uh, I mean, tr Trunks arrive. Even Little Pan arrives unseen, and she's entering the tournament. So everyone's entering the tournament. And so uh, we cut to the tournament where everyone has arrived and we get a, a, a fun little scene where pan runs in to get a hug from grandpa Satan, who now has a much more receded hairline, which I love this little detail. And like, she kind of interrupts him and boo discussing, um, their plans to kind of rig the tournament, which is also fun. And everyone moves out to take their seats and they're leaning on Mr. Satan to kind of get them hooked up since all the seats are taken. And at first they're kind of like, set out on like the lawn right on the edge of the arena where everyone can look at them, which is kind of funny because I feel like Mr. Satan would love a spot like that where he can bask in the attention, but they of course throw a little bit of a fit. They're moved to kind of an upstairs second floor, you know, looking from a window where everyone can't see them. And I, I don't know. I just kind of like that little bit of 
flavor or whatever you want to call it as Mr. Satan pulls the uh, the strings for his family. It's kind of fun. And they, yeah, they kind of get like box seats as a, a bit of a correction to the original situation. And then we kind of move to basically seeing all of the contestants. And one of the contestants, if we didn't already mention, is... Pan is Gohan and Videl's four-year-old daughter, and there is no junior division in the tournaments at this point. So Pan is participating with the rest of the adults, and we find that she has quickly passed through the prelims. So she's going to be fighting in the full-on brackets for the tournament. <laughs> well, I... My thing is, is I don't know why anyone would look at any of these other characters when Dragon Ball just came up with the perfect character in this scene, which is some guy with no shirt, leather pants and like a pirate hat. So my bets are on that guy. I thought you were going to say Mr. Chicken. <laughs> Mr. Chicken's great, but I think uh, shirtless pirate hat guy is definitely, definitely the guy I'm going to put my money on. He, he looks like a police stripper <laughs> <laughs> say, yeah he looks i don't know straight out of the village people or something like that i don't know yeah. what's going on with this guy but my money's on him um and during these pairings goku leans over to boo and kind of whispers over like hey can you use some of that boo magic to fix our matches like you do mr satan's which is hilarious by the way and this is where goku is going to use kind of some tomfoolery to make sure he gets his fight with a mysterious new combatant that he's been kind of sensing off in the ether that's shown up for this fight. This is kind of the whole impetus for Goku even participating in this tournament, right? Is that he he found out that this person would be participating, and so he has Boo rig the brackets such that he is... Goku is now paired up with this young boy who appears to be no more than maybe 10 years old, which is going to be important. And his name is Oob, hmm. which, yeah. That's crazy. Well, it's pretty quickly pointed out that this fighter is probably the reincarnation of Boo he asked for. <laughs> it's not really a secret they hold long. And the one detail, though, is that um, Goku points out that it was a wish likely granted by King Yama. And I thought that was a very interesting detail. Yeah, I, I mean, we've kind of been told through different pieces of lore in Dragon Ball that usually for the people who don't keep their bodies like Goku did in Otherworld, a soul is usually wiped or scrubbed clean and then is put into a new body, is basically reincarnated. That's kind of what happens in the Dragon Ball universe, is some form of reincarnation where the 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 new soul or the new creature with that soul doesn't know or remember its past life or have any memories whatsoever. That's kind of the scrubbing part. So presumably that's kind of what King Yemma did, was took that soul of Boo and then put it into a human boy. Yeah, it's I don't know, it's it's very interesting that King Yemo is just like, "Yeah, sure. You did you did great, Goku. Here's your reincarnated boo that you asked for." <laughs> it's such a interesting wish to grant, but I mean, we're going to learn more about this as we go in episode 167. Even stronger, Goku's dream is never ending, which that, that is a really weird episode name. It's a little weird. It kind of alludes to what's going to happen, and at least it's not so much of a wild spoiler like every other title. But as the tournament begins with one of my favorite characters, Announcer Man, bringing us into the fights, we see that Pan is going to be fighting this... I think they say he's like seven foot six, and is just like this hulking slab of muscle. And he's full on just like... Why do I have to fight this kid? This is bullshit. Blah, 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 blah. And as soon as the fight starts between the two of them, Pan slaps his shit and kicks him out of the ring. <laughs> it's a quick match. Watching this little four-year-old just smack this giant Goliath around. I mean, it's hilarious. And of course, everyone's stunned. No one expects this outcome except for the people who know who Pan is. And I mean, it's fun. It's Dragon Ball. It's 
watching a baby just smack around a, a grown ass man. It's it's fun. And I don't know. I like it. I actually like this kind of side of Dragon Ball where it's comedy, but it's in line comedy. Yeah, it's in line comedy. It I mean it feels honestly not too much unlike uh like Goku and Krillin joining the tournaments and just like stomping people. They were they were young. They were probably 12 years old something like that um but they weren't four years old like pan here which is you know even just kind of ex expanding on that level of comedy but it's quickly going to take us into the next fight which is goku versus oob yeah and as these two enter the the ring um and to kind of comment on what oob looks like he's this really gangly skinny kid with like a mohawk and he's wearing basically um what do you call it like a toga i don't know what you call it but he's just got like a strip of cloth over him and when he enters the ring he's like nervous his hands are shaking and this is this is somebody who looks like they've never been in a real fight before as he enters the arena but i mean he's made it past the preliminaries so I, goku better be right about this guy because all he's thinking about is like winning the match and for his people back home. That's, that's all we really know about this. Ooh, fella. Yeah. Uh, and Goku picks up quickly on the fact that Oob is terrified being in this ring with all these people watching and Goku's strategy here, which I don't know how I feel about this strategy. It's an interesting one. Uh, it seems to be an effective one as Goku takes on the role of the bad guy and just starts saying, just trash talking. He basically says like, Oob, you're ugly. I'm going to kill you and send your bones back to your parents who are also ugly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like Goku level insults, right? Like Goku doesn't really do that with people. And even I think Shemmel nails the delivery too, where he's just kind of like, and uh, your, your family's dumb or whatever. <laughs> like he's not even really trying that hard. Yeah. It, it sounds like like something a a school grade kid would say. Like it, it it, it makes sense. I agree. The Shemmel's delivery is very good. It sounds it sounds out of character, and I think it's supposed to sound out of character. Yeah, uh, but this gets under Oob's skin after well after Goku delivers a you know like a little bit of a kick to him, and this is where Oob tightens his fists with rage, and it's mostly the insult to his parents that really gets him going. And this young boy goes in the attack and Goku's knocked across the ring. And finally, the battle actually begins and we can kind of get a glimpse of the actual power of Oob at this point. I mean, this is, this is great as Goku like gets knocked across the ring and then like kind of gets back up on his hands and knees. And he's just got this big grin on his face like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm here for, baby. <laughs> <laughs> like smack me around. I came all the way out here to get smacked around and I'm getting it. Yeah, and he's going to get in some more, but he, I mean, he, he, Goku starts actually getting into the fight and starts like blocking some of Oob's attacks, even gets to a point where he grabs Oob and like throws him down into the ring, uh, and like an over the shoulder toss. And as they start going back and forth, I think Vegeta's the one who basically expresses this kid is learning at, after every blow, like he's learning how to fight on the fly real time right now. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there's even a moment where Goku actually gets clobbered pretty good and is sent crashing into the arena floor. And there's kind of this brief moment where everyone thinks that the battle is over, but then Goku erupts out of the arena, just surrounded and he's still in his base form, but he's surrounded in key and he lightly touches down in front of Oob, and he's like, all right, I'm ready for round two, in his cheerful Goku voice. Yeah, and... I mean, this is this is just kind of funny, as Goku's basically, like... Like you said, he's in his base form, so he's he's not taking it too serious, um, but he, he, at this point, knocks Oob around quite a bit, and... Eventually, he gets Oob to really, like, power up. You can see his aura, like, showing around him. And he goes on the offensive trying to attack Goku, but overshoots it, not really realizing his own power as Goku kind of dodges in the air 
um, with Oob now like hanging off the edge of the arena and Goku is about ready to blast him with a Kamehameha and stops when he sees that Oob's about ready to fall off. Yeah, and I mean, Oob basically kind of outs himself in this match, right? And um, Goku catches the young fighter, I think before he hits the ground, um, which doesn't really matter here, but <clears throat> uh, Goku apologizes to Oob after um, after kind of touching down with him for the for the name calling and then offers to come live with Oob to train him. Dayton and I talked about this a little bit before the podcast, and I think most of the Dragon Ball community feels like this is a strange decision on Goku's part. <laughs> yeah, I... I mean, it's so weird because he's like, oh yeah, I'll just come live with them. Oh, you're just, and he's just like, yeah, you're just here for the prize money? Well, I'll just go ask Mr. Satan for some money and then, yeah, then we can train for the next, like, five years. And, I mean, Goku even then, like, announces this to his family and, like, Pan is crying and Chi-Chi's hysterical and Goku's like, yep, I'm gonna go train this boy I just found. It's real weird. I know you mentioned, Dayton, that it's also weird because Goku was, like, training Goten. There are some implications that Goku has trained Pan. And instead of training his family, his son and his granddaughter, he's going to go train this random boy. I guess not entirely random. He's the reincarnation of Boo. But there's no, there's no connection there beyond that. Yeah, and I mean, part of me is wondering, like, why didn't Goku just, like, like, offer to, like, bring Oob's family, like, all the money and food that they could ever want, and then just be like, all right, like, if I solve your problem, you have to come train with me sort of thing. But I thought about that. That feels a little bit too much like purchasing a human, like, people trafficking, so I understand why <laughs> they didn't do that. But, like, there had to have been better solutions to this than Goku abandoning his family for... And my thing is, is, like... We just went through this thing with Goku where he was gone and like his family missed him like crazy. And then by the end of all this boo shenanigans, it's like, all right, guys, like the elder Kai gave his life for me. And that allowed me to, to come back to the, you know, living world. Now I can stay with you guys. And now he's just going to like leave him for like five or 10 years or something. Like, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm being jerked all over the place with like, what is going on with Goku? It's a little weird. And I mean, admittedly, it's been 10 years since the Boo stuff, so he's bored. presumably... What? Bored. He just want to be a dad. Bored. Being dad's <laughs> boring. I want to go do something else. Be someone else's dad. That's right. Uh, yeah, but in addition to that, presumably has spent those 10 years with his family, right? It doesn't... For the audience, it doesn't feel that way to us because it's jumping from Boo getting killed to 10 years in the future. Uh, so we don't really get that sense of time and that sense of you yeah, it know. probably felt like an eternity for Goku oh Jesus definitely <laughs> but this guy can teleport wherever the hell he wants as long as he can send somebody there why doesn't he just go to the village fight with Oob teleport home for dinner and to sleep in a bed with his wife what yeah it's I mean the thing is yeah there's no like transportation costs or anything. That's also that like Goku really works a job. He can go train the entire day. He just has to come home at night. Like what is going on? It's so weird. I mean, the only thing that I could even remotely justify this in my head with is honestly not even in universe stuff. It would be just the fact that we as the audience are kind of getting to experience and feel this element of, Goku leaving, Goku departing, because this is the end of Dragon Ball Z. And so it's it's almost kind of like forcing that feeling of like Goku leaving and we're kind of leaving the story with Goku. Man, my, my thing, though, I and I, I like your explanation, right? It at least gives me something to to reason with it. Like I, I at least have some base level understanding of what they might've been thinking when they wrote it. But for me, like I look at the end of the cell saga and I thought that was a, a beautiful farewell for Goku, right? Like we already had a great, like, all right, he's gone. Like, 
<sighs> or even the end of the Frieza saga. That's a beautiful farewell to Goku. Like he sacrificed his life to save a galactic threat, right? And he's gone. But, you know, OK, got it. <sighs> this is like the worst possible option out of all the things I've seen, especially since I think if they would have ended the Boo series just a couple episodes earlier with him with his family and everyone's having fun and we're living in peacetime. And I mean, that's a really wholesome, great spot to end the story on. Right. Um, I would have felt closure there. I, there, I didn't really have any big questions at that point. Like he's living with his family and it's peacetime. Cool. Like the day was saved and everyone's happy and the earth is, you know, as good as it's ever been. That's awesome. Now I'm like, all right, his family's in disarray. See you guys later. Yeah, no, I, I agree with your assessment there. I will say the only question that these episodes answer from my perspective is if Goku's wish for Boo to come back and be reincarnated actually comes true. And honestly, I didn't need that question answered. <laughs> no, I didn't. I also didn't need that wish. I also don't know why he made that wish. Like... I don't know why he looked at Boo and was just like, man, I wish you were a good guy so I could fight you a lot. Like, so why would you think that? This man, this creature just killed, like, your entire family. You, this creature just killed, like, everyone you've ever known and love has, like, an immense amount of blood on their hands. This creature wasn't even born. They were created of pure evil. Out of all the things that I think you should not feel any sympathy for or make a wish like that, it's that thing. The uh, the only thing I'll say about that is that to me, and I, I agree with what you said, to me, the reason that Goku did that is I, I'll, I'll put throw two things out there. One is that we always kind of get that impression of we even talked about it a little bit where Goku always tries to kind of redeem the bad guy like he let he let Vegeta live uh, when Vegeta tried to kill him and Earth and everything. Uh, he he let Frieza go multiple times or tried to, uh, and he let Majin Buu, Fat Buu, live. So it kind of plays into that. The second one, though, that I think is maybe makes even more sense is it is a very selfish wish because Goku loves fighting strong opponents. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, but the yeah. I agree with what you said other than that, but those are kind of like, to me, the character reasons why they have that, that wish in there. But I still don't think I need that question answered. I don't, it doesn't mean anything to me that Boo comes back. Now, now it just means that you don't even need Dragon Balls to make wishes. You can just get whatever the hell you want. <laughs> oh, that means that's all I'm getting at. Dragon Balls are useless. We've evolved beyond Dragon Balls. We don't even need them anymore. Just say what you want to come into fruition <laughs> and it, it, King Yama just makes it happen. Like snaps his fingers like Goku, you got one lifetime, whatever you want. <laughs> like gosh. you get w one wish for every time you save the planet. <laughs> oh, it just, I, I'm just extra upset because I felt like they had the perfect stopping point just a couple episodes ago where we have this really wholesome, like family and friends oriented moment. We have peace time. We have everything like everything's great. You save the day and here's the, you know, the fruits of saving the day right here in front of you. And it was such a good spot. And then now, not only do you introduce this question, but now like Goten seems kind of like pathetic. Um, Gohan, of course, is not training still. Uh, there might be a future with Pan, but at this point, I don't think there is because it's Dragon Ball and we don't do anything with uh, other characters i don't know <laughs> yeah i i mean i agree with everything that you've said about it i i think there's just a few little details to effectively wrap up this episode we're kind of talking about the whole ending as a whole here but just so that everybody gets the the full scope of the ending are you gonna talk about the scenes where goku's flying around with uba on his shoulders like he's his new son this that's about the only <laughs> other thing is goku gets Oob on his back and they fly away to the village. He's like giving uh, him a piggyback ride as he's abandoning his family. Yes, 100%. Which kind of takes us into the very tail end of just a effectively like a slideshow montage of like the tournament and stuff. Uh, what looks like 
Pan slapping Goten shit in and beating him. Um, Master Roshi being a perv and then just kind of the shot of a smiling Goku excited that he gets to fight and train this really strong kid. And that takes us to the end credits and wraps up Dragon Ball Z Kai. Yeah. Um, I mean, man, it's been a hell of a journey. And I mean, gosh, I have so many thoughts about Kai. So many thoughts about the Boo series. I like, I have a lot to think about, but I'm going to stay focused and I'm just going to comment on these chunks, this chunk of episodes, what we just covered right now. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off, uh, with a, I thought this chunk of episodes that we covered tonight, I thought it was mostly good. And I say that because I think there was some excellent fight animation and watching Kid Buu fight is just a joy. Like it's, it's probably one of the best parts about the Boo series is just watching how creative they are with Boo, how creatively he fights and how fun those battles are. There's some great animation in here as well. Um, seeing Vegeta's story kind of come full circle is incredible. Um, and watching Mr. Satan kind of unexpectedly step into the role of actually being Earth's savior is really stinking rad. And I liked watching that too. Um, so those are all my big high points. My couple critiques are um, the last couple episodes could have been just chopped off. I think it's a better series if those aren't there. It's not like uh, we had talked about the original Dragon Ball ending and how they could have chopped off that last chunk. This isn't as bad as that, but it's another one of those scenarios of you could have ended this, you know, a little while ago and it would have been better. Um, I mean, and I think I've mentioned this before. I, when Kid Boo was defeated, when he died, I didn't have like that, like exhale moment that I've had with so many other boss fights where I'm like holding my breath and I'm tensed out and I'm just like, oh my gosh, with the Kid Boo fight, it, I don't know. It just, it kind of didn't, I didn't feel anything because I think it, it didn't really mean much that Goku beat Kid Boo, even though there's a lot of other important beats happening in my eyes with Vegeta and Mr. Satan. Um, I mean, the way we beat Kid Buu is we resurrected everyone back so that way Goku could have their energy. And then when Goku couldn't beat him with that energy, we just wished for him to have more energy. And that's not the most compelling kind of fight to me. Um, outside of that, mostly good notes. I want to emphasize in the good ones. I have my critiques, but as far as the ending of the Buu series, these nine episodes, overall, pretty good. I think I pretty much all of what you said, I agree with. I, I'll add a little, a few more details for my own perspective on it. But yeah, Kid Buu versus Goku, incredible fight, incredible animation, incredible choreography, super fun to see the, the, those two characterized and embodied in, in a fight. And I, I'm a Vegeta fanboy. Seeing his, this to me is like, Vegeta's story arc from the start of Dragon Ball Z to the end of Dragon Ball Z is wildly satisfying for Vegeta's arc and seeing him go from the villain who doesn't care about anybody else to the hero. I mean, he he's not the hero that that title goes to Mr. Satan, but uh, he he comes up with the plan. He he gives up a lot of his ego and I would argue even a bit of his pride to say that Goku or Kakarot is the best and he's the only one who can do this in defeating Boo and man I love Mr. Satan's story through this like I, I gushed about it enough I won't dwell on it too much but getting to be the the guy who took all of these accolades and did not deserve them to using those accolades to become the true hero. And uh, man, it's, it's such a good story. Um, and like you said, Dayton, it also makes him much more likable as we see these heroic traits. And those are my, probably my biggest high points. Um, I kind of like, uh, this is a little bit of a, 
my take on what you said, Dayton, about you don't really care about Goku beating Boo. One of the things that I do like about it is Vegeta's concept of we or people uh, like the Z fighters keep saving the Earth. It's time for the Earthlings to save themselves. And I kind of like like the idea, especially the idea of getting to see like Ader and Suno and all these people that Goku has positively impacted their lives really come back into the fold. And because of Goku's previous actions, they have a big positive impact on him defeating Boo in this moment. Those are really good tie-ins, really good storytelling. I do agree with what you said, Dayton, in that I think as I kind of move maybe more into my critiques of the Boo arc, or at least this chunk of it, we've kind of expressed a lot throughout the Boo arc that we were disappointed that Gohan and Goten, like the new generation did not, the torch was not passed on to them. It, it kind of got like put into their hands and then immediately ripped away. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. They weren't really given their moment. No, not at all. And that's, that is a bummer. Uh, I wish that Gohan had been the one to actually defeat Boo. I think that even, even though Boo is not a great villain, I think that would have been far more meaningful for Gohan to kind of take on that mantle of the hero, the savior of the earth. I mean, he kind of did with Cell, uh, but to see it cemented in him becoming an adult and realizing what it means to defend the earth is way more meaningful than Goku coming back to life and being like, well, got to beat this guy. My kids couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it wasn't even that hard to bring him back. Hardly an inconvenience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> um, the only downside to that is that it, the only downside to Gohan taking on the mantle and actually going that route would have been we potentially miss out on Vegeta's characterization. I think that there's maybe ways they could have done it if you kind of keep Goku dead instead. Uh, I mean, can you imagine the um, the emotion that Vegeta would have if not only he was suppressed by, by Kakarot, but he watched his son, you know, once again kind of exceed his, his capability? Like, I still think Vegeta, there's a lot of good ways to write Vegeta around that. That's a really good point. Honestly, it would show even more growth if Vegeta was like, well... Gohan, the son of Kakarot, treats fighting and treats growth the same as his father does. And I can see now how that is valuable. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that still could have gone in there. I think that Mr. Satan still could have had his moment to shine. Um, honestly, one, th one thought I had earlier today when I was watching this, I kind of like the idea, if you just pull Goku out of the equation and put Gohan in there, if you have Gohan be the one who uses the spirit bomb against Boo, I've kind of mentioned before that I really like the parallels of like Gohan wearing Goku's outfit, Gohan taking on the mantle that Goku had as the hero of, of Earth, the savior of Earth, and going even one step further to say that Gohan learned the spirit bomb, whether it be by himself, uh, whether it be he, you know, trained with King Kai, whatever, uh, or if Goku even taught it to him, I really kind of like that cementing Gohan in, in that role and that, like, all those tiebacks and throwbacks to Goku. Yeah, actually, I like that a lot more. And it also makes that kind of that symbology of Gohan asking to wear the same outfit of his father earlier on. It makes that feel like it makes a lot more sense. Um, cause like I said, when I saw it happen and I remember mostly what happened in the boo arc when we saw that, I was just like, eh, doesn't really do it for me. I feel like he's had trainers that he's learned more from and was closer to, but, um, if he, if he steps into that role and actually becomes earth's protector, like his father is or was, then I like it more. I think Then I'm a little bit different. I feel a little bit more differently about that because now we're seeing kind of that change in character from Gohan. We're seeing him really accept that role. It's not just stepping into your father's shoes. It's literally putting them on at that point. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that could be way more interesting. Obviously, there would have to be tweaks with like Ooh, Goku coming back and, and the Pacino dynamic and... of like, like you know that you know Gohan is probably like going to be your your son in law or whatever here soon, and like you get that weird dynamic as you know you're trying to save the Earth, and now Hercule has to like form that kind of relationship with you, or there's a lot of stuff you could play off of there if that's happening. I and you bring up a good point. I kind of uh, that was in the back of my head too, where especially the fact that Mr. Satan did not like Gohan and did not like Gohan, what do you want to call it, flirting with his daughter or hanging out with his daughter. So Mr. Satan would have to kind of overcome that and, like you said, work together with his future son in law. Uh, so they they have to form that bond. It's not. I love Mr. Satan's story, but there's nothing, there's no meaningful connection between Mr. Satan and Goku or, or even Vegeta in this case. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's not imperative to the story or anything, but it's a cool little backdrop and it's some notes and points that you can play off of and you can really form a connection. And, and yeah, I, I think there's a lot you could do there. You're just adding more elements, more connections between these characters and more drama that you can play off of and make it a more compelling story. I think. I just want to add one last point to that because I don't want to beat it into the ground. But <laughs> I also, you, you're making me think of additional things where Gohan was the one who defeated Cell. Mr. Satan was the one who took the credit for that. And then if you had that situation that we're describing with Boo, Gohan has to defeat Boo. Mr. Satan has to take credit for it, but they have to work in tandem to actively make that work, which is... A beautiful parallel. <laughs> I, man. Oh, well, I didn't even think about this until now, but yeah, that's, that's such a good story. If we do it that way. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm on board with it. <laughs> I know it, it didn't me... happen, but I'm on board with it. Yeah. That is the, that's my head cannon now. It makes me angry that that's not what happened, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, what, so what's your gut feeling what, after watching these nine episodes? What's your, what's your kind of like gut like from eh to it was fantastic. I think it, I think it was good. I think it was mostly good. Um, like I said, I, I wish they would have changed the story a little bit. And like you said, they should have cut it off earlier. I don't think that those last three episodes have any business being there, honestly. Uh, but I I don't think like the Boo arc as a whole and even this ending is as bad as people say it is. I think it deserves more credit than people give it for some of the very good story arcs. Um, what about you, Dayton? Did you have any other thoughts on it? Uh, I mean, it's just, you know, I think I've said this a few nights where there are, I, for some reason, I have worse memories of the Boo series than I think it actually was. Um, I don't think it's like blown my expectations out of the water. Like I haven't, it hasn't super exceeded them. But there's been a lot of notes and maybe a lot of subtleties that I didn't pick up on when I was younger that I'm noticing now. And there's actually a lot of clever writing kind of hidden in here and story arcs that take place over the course of dozens of episodes that aren't the main story that are really easy to kind of miss the nuance of if you're not paying attention to them or know to pay attention to them. Like, I'm pretty sure the first time I watched the Boo stuff, I had no idea that Mr. Satan was going to be part of a storyline. I didn't really pay attention to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think he kind of gets written off a lot and and yeah that that's i think that's the thing for me for boo is that i don't really care that much about boo and boo's story but there's really good character writing like there's at least the initial good writing or idea for passing the torch to gohan and goten and trunks that doesn't happen but there's great character arc for Vegeta and great character arc for Mr. Satan. Uh, and then some little sprinklings at the end of like the earth having to fend for themselves and all that or earthlings. So I like a lot of the pieces. It just missed the mark on a cohesive story, I guess, which is yeah. probably why people don't and like at it. At the end of the day, it's still Dragon Ball content. It's obviously Dragon Ball Z. You're not mistaking it for anything else. And I mean, I'm enjoying the content. It's just, you know, is this one going to rank high up on, on my list of series? Probably not. Um, but that doesn't mean it's bad. Doesn't mean I dislike it. I had a good time watching all these episodes and the, the fight against Kid Boo, 
like I said, Kid Buu is one of the funnest characters to to watch fight because of all the weird stuff he's going to do. He's a very fun opponent, um, unlike Jiren. And that's something that, I mean, you got to give the series credit for. Whether or not the fight is super meaningful, like Goku winning the day doesn't really mean anything for Goku. But there's a lot of other things that are happening that are meaningful. So just pay attention to them. Focus on the good stuff. Come on. Yeah, maybe this is something we'll cover at another time, but... I would argue as strictly a visual spectacle, the fight between Goku and Kid Buu, top five. Like, Ooh. it's it's probably up there for me, man. It's it's real good. It doesn't have the meaning that, like, Cell versus Gohan has or Goku versus Frieza has as far as, like... Are you counting the movies as well? Probably. Wow. that's That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to go think about all the different fights, but it, it's up there for me, man. The it's it's really well animated. It's really cool to watch Boo and Goku. Uh, no, I just I just think of the moments where they're like gorilla hopping over the over the key blast and like spinning through the air and firing stuff. I I mean, there's a lot of effort that's put into this fight. You're I I'm not arguing with you. It's just like I know it's good. But now I need to start thinking about, like, how good is it? Because I really have not put that much thought into it. That's almost certainly going to be a, a future podcast Ooh, episode is Top wow. Fights. Oh, come on. But... <laughs> Don't start tipping our hand that early. <laughs> but uh, at this point, I think we've covered most of everything for these episodes and the tail end of Dragon Ball Z Kai. Did you have anything else you wanted to discuss, Dayton? Uh, no. I mean, it just it honestly feels freaking crazy being like through this much dragon ball at this point that's the thing i'm like struggling to wrap my head around i mean we've we've covered hundreds of episodes of dragon ball um most of the mainline content um we're talking about ways of of possibly doing gt here in the near future so i'm not i'm not sure what the game plan is on that yet but i mean yeah we're getting to the point where we've almost covered the entirety of dragon ball and that's that's mind blowing i can't believe wow well anyone who's been along for this journey, thank you so much. Like we really appreciate your, your, our, your viewership. You can't view us. Um, your <laughs> listenership. <laughs> and we Hearing appreciate us talk. Yeah, we appreciate your support and just kind of listening in and hang out with us. Yeah, no, I I totally agree. Yeah, we've covered we've covered the original Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Super, and Dragon Ball Z or Z Kai technically at this point. Uh, God, the only thing that's left out there is GT, and then potentially movie content, but we're definitely going to keep making content moving into the future. So uh, we do have one more episode that we'll talk about here coming up. Uh, but for tonight, that's going to be it for this episode of Instant Transmission, where we discuss everything Dragon Ball. This has been your host, Todd. And Dayton. Don't forget, we are on Patreon and Twitter. Woo. If you want to help the podcast grow like Krillin's hair, God. you can find us at patreon.com slash itdbpodcast and over on Twitter at x.com slash itdbpodcast. That stands for Instant Transmission Dragon Ball Podcast, ITDB Podcast. And please like, review, and subscribe on whatever podcasting platform you're listening to us on. Thank you all so much for your support. Be sure to join us next time as we rate and review the entirety of Dragon Ball Z Kai. <laughs> That's going to be an episode. <laughs> like with our previous series reviews, we'll be breaking the series into arcs and rating them from 1 to 10 and finally giving Dragon Ball Z Kai as a whole a rating of its own. Will the Saiyan arc reign supreme? Or will Cell and Frieza have a thing to say about that? Or is the Garlic Jr. Saga going to make a surprise appearance and clean house? Find out a next time. And to all our fellow Dragon Ball fans, stay safe out there and remember to keep rocking the dragon.
Oh God, don't. We're gonna do GT, aren't we? <laughs> God, God save, God save us, help! 